Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to the Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture. And today, our topic is the Christian family in the midst of a swirling world. And uh, my guest today is Chip Ingram, and it's a real pleasure to have you with us, Chip. Uh, he's here this week uh, at the seminary giving a series of lectures uh, that uh, w- when we give someone a whole week at the seminary, we're, we're highly committed to what they have to say to us. So uh, we're excited. And, and Chip has done a, a lifetime of ministry as a, as a pastor and has his own uh, radio program in ministry. Why don't you tell us about that? What is it that you've been doing? Well, Daryl, I've uh, you know, obviously been a pastor for about 30 years, and then we kept running out of room, and someone put it on a local station and it multiplied and grew in about the last 15, 16 years to a lot of stations here and around the world. But my real passion out of that was uh, I ended up traveling around the world a lot in my time with Walk Through the Bible and then they started putting things on video and and so uh, we want to help Christians live like Christians. And so our passion at Living on the Edge, even though we kind of do teaching Mm -hmm. and then we take just extreme effort to get people in small groups. So we launched about 160,000 small groups in the last three years. Oh, wow. And then created resources to coach people because we think life change really happens, not because you just hear or know the truth, but in the context of community, applying it, holding each other accountable, loving each other, places where it's safe. And then we get people on mission and say, okay, you know, 24-7, where God planted you. So that's what I'm all about, and it's a thrill to be here. Well, great. Well, you did that so fast. The name of the program is? It's called Living on the Edge. Okay. And uh, I won't ask you what the edge is like, but anyway. <laughs> it's where I live in California, <laughs> the Silicon Valley. Cali- and it's, there you uh, go. Okay. So where are you exactly in California? We're in Los Gatos, California. Uh-huh. It is um, in just the edge of San Jose, right in the Bay Area. Area. Mm-hmm. So you're uh, there with the cats, huh? In there with the cats, that's right. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, it's a unique community. 37% of the people in the Silicon Valley, mm-hmm. um, San Jose area, are born outside the United States. Mm-hmm. 51% speak another language at oh, home. Wow. And so it's a super multicultural. 15, 20 minutes, you have Palo Alto, Stanford, mm-hmm. Google, Facebook. So it's, it's an exciting place to live. Oh, wow. Well, very, very unchristian, <laughs> yeah. but very exciting. Yeah, well, uh, it's the way our world is, and that's part of what we want to talk about. We want to talk about living Christianly and preparing your Christian family to live in a kind of culture that we find ourselves in. And there's a lot to celebrate that goes on around us in the world in terms of the beauty that's created and the art that exists and that kind of thing. But there also are a lot of challenges to being a Christian today. Um, let, let's talk about uh, about Christian family and setting a right tone for your uh, for your kids. And I think the best way to do this might be to just move through the phases of life, if you will, okay, okay? Um, uh, rather than just dive in. So let's talk first about the family that has really little kids and, and setting the right tone for, for the home, uh, for, for a family that, say, has uh, toddlers and kindergartners and, and, and that level. How do you, how do you get started in, in, in uh, setting the tone for what a house should look like? Well, that was a challenge for Therese and myself. Uh, We both came from non-Christian homes, and both came from dads that were alcoholics, fairly functioning. And so I remember uh, we had kids, and it was like, I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So you know, I read a couple books, and I was around some good families, and I think you need to really lay down what is it as our objectives. Do we want our kids to be holy, or Mm -hmm. do we want them to be happy? Mm -hmm. And uh, so in those toddler years, we really tried to set some things up that we wanted uh, sitting around the table and eating together and talking, Mm -hmm. Uh, putting your kids to bed and reading them stories, Uh, making very few rules, but, you know, having clear boundaries where you help the little ones understand this is right, this is wrong, Mm -hmm. understanding intellectually they can't grasp all these concepts you don't need to explain a ton of things so you didn't do the ontological trinity with them <laughs> no we uh, we we waited for third grade for <laughs> okay, that <one>. okay <laughs> but but i mean it was just really loving them a lot uh, modeling is so big at that age it, but also i think that what i watch happening now that i have grandkids that age mm-hmm. is there's such a uh, a pool to make kids the center of the world mm-hmm. and everything revolves around them that doesn't produce healthy kids yeah uh, you want you want kids to understand you know 
God is the center of our family, and not just in words, but what you do and how you model that. And we did the same. We I remember we had these little um, stories that were done by Concordia Press, which is a Lutheran press, that are all in rhyme. That would be the stories that we'd read every night. And it got to the point where I would have read them enough that I could stop in the middle of the sentence and they would finish yeah. it and that kind of thing. And it, it just – it does. It sets a right kind of tone and, and puts a uh, puts a right, uh, a, a right feel to the family in terms of the types of things that you talk about. Now, I'll tell you something that we didn't do well. We're, I'm not a big eat-around-the-table person. Mm-hmm. I tend to, to – Eat, eat in the living room, and and so we tended to be real informal about the way we structure that. I think I'd do that differently yeah. if I were, if I had a chance to start over again. Uh, but uh, but you're right. When they're young, it's important. And and here's another question that often comes up: How much should a parent say it's the church's job to help with the kids, as opposed to my job? Because after all, they're the professionals. Well, I think that is a myth. Mm-hmm. Uh, the church will not stand before God for your kid, you will. Mm-hmm. And so I really felt like, even even not just spiritually, uh, we lived in a part of the country that had very, very poor education, uh, had uh, schools where I watched my kids in school, like in the really early grades, they weren't learning. Hmm. And I realized, you know something? Uh, I, I own that. So mm-hmm. I, I took that on at home, and we had to kind of educate our kids because I thought, you know, they're getting good grades as they kept pushing them through. But I, th- I think it's our responsibility. You know, Deuteronomy 6 talks about it's that when they rise and when you walk. Exactly. And it's, and it's, the, it's the whole ambiance of your home. And so mm-hmm. it's not just we read a story or eat together. It's, you know, you're, you're, you're playing games and mm-hmm. you're talking. And I was really committed uh, because of my background of not coming to Christ that it was going to be an exciting, adventurous, fun place to live in my house mm-hmm. and also very word-centered. Yes. And, and so I, I take it then I, it's clear you put your kids in schools. Were they Christian schools or public schools? You know, or? we did we did both. In the uh-huh. early years, we, we kind of did both because, frankly, there were a lot of limited options. My, my personal perspective was in those very early years uh, when kids can't rationally reason, mm-hmm. I wanted the school to be on my team. I mm-hmm. wanted them reinforcing things. At junior high, we evaluated each kid and what was best, and all of our kids spent either all or some time in public high schools. Interesting. And we spent a lot of time around the table. We talked about evolution, sexuality, mm-hmm. and, and my kids saw themselves as missionaries. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that really helped them own their faith. I think you have to look at your child, where they're at, what's their maturity, what's the environment, and you make individual That's decisions. That's a, a great, that. great um, advice. I mean, I, I, we also put our kids in uh, in, Christ, in in sorry in public schools after a start in Christian school, yeah. and uh, and we di- and we did it for the reason that we really wanted them to be able to grow up and interact with the culture, and we wanted to be around them as they were learning right. those lessons, and be able to reinforce what was going on because we were afraid that if it was, you know, I'm in a seminary, so it's seminary church, you know, Christian school, that they would never get a sense of uh, of what of the larger world that they would live in. And of course, uh, we did sabbaticals in Germany, which put them in German schools in second language. So that was a whole other wow. kind of experience in which they, you know, they were learning German in, at eight and nine and five. They were learning German with kids from Serbia and Bosnia, and you know, I mean, that that was a completely different kind of experience. Now, that's something you most people don't get the chance to replicate. But it's what it did teach our kids is there the the world has no boundaries. You yes. can go and function anywhere, and that was a very very valuable experience. Okay, let's talk about the 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 black hole years they, they, as they grow up and they hit the edge of elementary school, begin junior high, um, hit the teenage years. Uh, my description of the teenager is um, you go from being at the top of the ladder in terms of greatness to way way down the list, and a kid oftentimes enters a black hole and they. Although our kids were good as teenagers, and and uh, then somewhere in their twenties you recover, mm-hmm. you know that when they hit their twenties you recover and you you may not get back quite to the level that you were when they were real young, but uh, but they begin to respect you again. And when that happens, don't ask how it happened or why. Just be grateful yes. that they've come back. So let's talk about those hard years. The the oftentimes the teenagers where kids are facing tough choices mm-hmm. and. And, and and parenting is tricky because you're trying to give them space as they're finding out who they are, and yet at the same time, uh, you've, you've got to be there for them. 
Well, I would say both by experience and watching this happen in the church forever, as research as well, is the greatest thing you can do is live the life before Him. Uh, when kids see you live differently at home than you do at church or outward, uh, that is a recipe for rebellion and hmm. rejecting your faith. Uh, I think the other thing is that you're not going to be uh, that person on the top, and I think a lot of parents struggle because as they feel rejection from their kids, they cave in mm -hmm. and give them things they know aren't very good or are passive. And so I think you need to be really strong in terms of these are the boundaries. Mm -hmm. I love you. You can never do anything that I'll stop loving you, but you can't have your own way. And and the culture, I mean, it's not just out there, it's in the church. Right. And so, I mean, I was the worst parent in the world, according to my kids at times, you know, <laughs> Dad, what do you mean we can't play that video game where yeah. people kill it? Well, we don't do that here. And, yeah. and you know, here's why. And, yeah. um, you know, music issues. And, and so we were never legalistic about uh, this makes you right or this makes you wrong, but we made our home the place that was fun, mm -hmm. the friends came over. And, and I, mean, I lived in Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz where mm -hmm. it's, um, they think Berkeley's too far right. Right, right. And so, you know, we had a world where... Uh, multiple sexuality, the trisexual, bisexual speakers were in all the public schools. Mm -hmm. And so my kids were bombarded with things, but they learned to own their faith. Mm -hmm. But well, you need to have sort of that open communication. And I think when you set boundaries, then make them few, but enforce them. And, uh, and you just keep loving them through it. And we had some that compliant personalities, they sailed right through. And I had one son that I mean, you know, no matter what I did, how hard it was, we look at, is that all you got? Yeah. So uh, I just think it's can, it can be tough water at times, but uh, you persevere and you love them and you model it. And How do you wrestle with the problem of deciding which battles are the ones worth fighting? I mean, you know, cause, because you can deteriorate into an environment in which everything is a battle. So how how do you how do you wrestle with with the choice of I'm going to give a child space here because mm -hmm. this is yeah it might not be the best decision but this is right. not one to go go to war on versus the ones that that really matter how do you help sort through that well what we tried to do is is really lay the foundation the, the earlier you start the better mm -hmm. and and having a real clear picture of what what do you want your kids to turn out on what what's your part and realize. You can't own all that. Your uh -huh. kids don't, you know, there's not a one to one correlation that these kind of parents produce these kind of kids. Right. But what I did know was that, um, you know, it's like letting out string on a kite. Uh -huh. And so what you, what you want to do is you want to feed them more and more responsibility. Mm -hmm. And then when it got to be one of those semi gray, rather than say yes or no, I would often ask my kids, well, what do you think you mm -hmm. ought to do? And, and well, Dad, I want to go to this, that. Okay, I'll tell you what, for 24 hours, I want you to pray about it, mm -hmm. and, and then let's get back and talk about it and tell me what God says to you. So I wanted the weight uh -huh. of their decisions to move from my mom or dad say yes or no to them. So you wanted them to own it. Yep. And and, and there's times where, like you said, it was yeah. like, this is probably not be the greatest decision, yeah. but that's how you learn to make good decisions. Yeah. But there were ones that I knew that the damage would be minor. Yeah. On on a couple others where you know they got involved maybe in dating a, a non-Christian, mm -hmm. and you could just see the writing on the hand What's that phrase? Handwriting on the wall. Yeah. And, and I, I set some really clear boundaries, and we had some, you know, I just can't believe you, and that's so ridiculous. Mm -hmm. and, but about 10 years later, they really thanked me when they – but but that was hard. And, mm -hmm. I, you know, there's no way around it. There, there are certain things I think you draw real clear lines. And then other things is just, you know – they make some decisions, they get some consequences, and they learn and they grow. Now, uh, uh, let's talk about um, devotions in the house and that kind of thing, because there are a variety of ways to encourage that in terms of what you encourage your kids to read, et cetera. Um, how, how did you handle those kinds of situations? We, uh, you know, we did some stuff around the table. We Dinner was like uh -huh. the most sacred thing, 5.30, and I was pastoring a very large church. Mm -hmm. It was growing. There was all kind of demands, but it was... Uh, I was there. The kids were there. We ate. We talked. Um, we we did tons of Bible stories foundationally and all mm -hmm. that. The older we got, it was more application, mm -hmm. interaction. Uh, I tried to help my kids early on develop some time with God. Mm -hmm. And so the older we got, it was more of the expectation is they would meet with God on their own. Right. And we would talk and discuss it. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't sort of this – the older you get, the more top-down you are, yeah. the more they reject it. Right. And, uh, and often it was uh, – Brief, mm -hmm. but very interactive. And then, 
you know, that's what our kids saw us do. And so right. most of them early on developed that habit. And I've since kind of read the research that if you walk with God personally mm-hmm. and your kids early on get in God's word for themselves, I was way more mm-hmm. excited about them meeting with God privately than us saying, you know, five out of seven times this week. We right. This it's not checking moment. a box on a program. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And, uh, and I think the – Especially in those times, too, is really grasping the, the teachable moments. I remember playing one-on-one in the driveway and being dripping with sweat mm-hmm. and you know talking to my son, isn't it great our bodies work and a 30-second prayer mm-hmm. or an ambulance goes by and you see a wreck that's – and you stop and you pray. I, they catch those things. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's kind of how we tried to do it. Oh, that's we were great, great. sort of formal in, in limited ways but really wanted them – to grow on their own. Now here's a real kind of practical question. I know that we have people in our church who wrestle with this. You know, are, we do have a culture that that encourages kids to participate in all kinds of activities, yeah. and particularly when they hit junior high and high school, the opportunities, whether it be band or sports or whatever, and the tension there becomes these events. Of course, oftentimes take place on the weekends, and right. oftentimes Sunday is a big big day for those kinds of events. So how did you sort – did you sort through those kinds of tensions, and, and how did you negotiate th- those elements of life? Well, I was – I mean, my dad was a great athlete. Mm-hmm. I went to college on a basketball scholarship, mm-hmm. so I'm a sports crazy guy, mm-hmm. played all kinds of sports with all my kids. But what I realized early on is that youth sports could take over your family. Mm-hmm. And we made it real clear that you know you could play one sport in one season. Uh, I'm watching families now right. who spend most of their time in a minivan or an SUV Absolutely. eating fast food. And again, the whole world is this, – it's this fear that, well, all the other kids are starting at three. I got news for you. Three, four, five, six-year-olds don't need to be in any kind of formal youth sports. <laughs> the NFL is not looking yet, right? Well, and, and so I think what you do is you say, this is what really matters, mm-hmm. and you draw some lines. And in most Christian, the culture right now, mm-hmm. you will feel like you're a salmon swimming upstream, even in the church, mm-hmm. to set some clear boundaries. So I wanted my kids to try different sports, and then as they had an appetite for one or other, and then we just set limits on how many we were going to do. Mm-hmm. And that whole traveling team, we thing. Uh, you talk about a black hole. I've mm-hmm. seen whole families that walked greatly with God. There's a lot of vicarious ego going on there. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of money spent that people don't have. Mm-hmm. And I watch people work all week and then literally wear themselves out for two days. All day Saturday, we got to go to this game, this game, this game, this game. Uh, very unwise, and I will tell you what it produces. It produces kids that don't believe that God is the primary aspect of their life. Mm-hmm. It produces families that get pulled apart mm-hmm. and people that honestly really thought that their own self-esteem had a lot to do with how their kid kicked the ball or made a basket. So mm-hmm. um, I, I think – now, we played sports. Mm-hmm. My kids played different sports. But they really understood our world's not going to revolve around your youth sports or your traveling team. Okay. Now, the variation on that, of course, is music. I mean, uh, uh, we had kids who – I had one son who did team soccer. I had uh, – uh, all, well, all our, all our kids – I have three children. Uh, all of them did band Yeah. Uh, so in high school. So that you know took up some time. And, and frankly, that was a rounding out experience for them. I yeah. went to a school where we didn't have a band, where we didn't do – I never learned to play any instrument at all. I mean, the only instrument I can play is my voice, and I don't play it very well. So, uh, um, so, so uh, what about what about those kinds of activities? And they may be school related as well in terms of they're pulling your kids into into relating to other kids. Well, our kids did all those. I mean, you know, one kid played basketball and volleyball, another wrestled. Uh, all my kids were musicians. Uh, a lot of that was is that we did something really – it was an experiment. Mm-hmm. And uh, when my kids were small, I realized that uh, I just had a habit because my parents did. It's amazing how you do things uh-huh. that you don't really think about it. And I just had the habit of um, – kind of from 9 o'clock to about 11 o'clock, you had to watch the news to stay up on life. So yeah. every night I'd you know watch an hour and a half of TV, and, and I thought, nothing bad, this or that. And so we did an experiment. We said, let's try on a school night what it's like not just to watch TV. Yeah. Well, we were – I mean, we were on each other, and everyone's irritable the first yeah. two, three days. Well, then – you know, pretty soon we're playing a game on the floor, and then kids are bored, so picks up a guitar, and uh-huh. someone goes to the piano, and and then pretty soon, you know, my lands, it's nine thirty, and there's nothing to do, so 
might as well just go to bed 9 30 or 10 <laughs> where you wake up at you know five right. and you're fresh and you gain a couple hours so our kids ended up during the week that experiment sort of got sustained uh-huh. and we ended up finding these hours in the day where you know they did those kind of things but we had a lot of time as a family because we really didn't let especially during the week the electronic stuff dominate our home interesting now how about how old were your kids when you made that move you know, with uh, mine are 13 years apart, okay. so they were about every age. I had one five, one twelve, and you know, one probably 14 oh, wow. in, in that area. Yeah. So. so again, we were hitting into the teenage years yes. where television can be attractive option. Yeah, television and surfing, uh, the, uh-huh. the video games. Just you gotta. Again, on the one hand, it's if it's never, 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 you're sort of this legalistic, completely apart from the world. Right. You know, your kids, believe me, they're at their friends' homes doing some stuff. Right, right, right. But so you want to give them opportunities, but at the same time, what I'm seeing, you mm-hmm. know, and I'm, I'm kind of in the trenches as a pastor, yeah. is I'm watching really smart people as right. parents, advocate as parents, and letting their kids spend incredible time on their phones, computers, and games. And can't figure out why there's no. As long as they're not in my hair, it's fine. It's yeah, exactly yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's a lot of energy. I mean, yeah. The fact that it's parenting, right? It's so much easier. I mean, you have to confront. You got to get up out of the chair. You have yeah. got to address the issues. And and my journey was, we would be real disciplined and real helpful, and my kids would really respond well. Mm-hmm. And the person who always got lazy was me. Uh-huh. And so when I got inconsistent, their mm-hmm. behavior changed. Uh-huh. And no matter what you're doing. Six weeks from now, it's probably not going to work. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's a journey. So you're, and you're, so you're constantly adjusting to what's yeah. going on and that yeah. kind of thing. Uh, well, that, that, that helps uh, teenagers. Let's talk about uh, a very sensitive area of life, I would say. And I've heard you speak about this, so this is one of the reasons I'm asking. How do you prepare your kids for their life mate? Hmm. Um, how do you uh, – I mean um, – I actually can use this. I have a twenty year old, a twenty eight year old son. He still hasn't found his his uh, his life. He may never do so, and I'm, I may have to come to grips with that. But anyway, uh, how do you help them find their life? Their life mate. What what are there things a, a parent can do to help in that regard? Yeah, I think one is you know again early on you want them to get a biblical worldview. <laughs> I, I think it's really important. And uh, don't let me go off on this. Mm-hmm. I've seen really really godly parents who their kids hit early teens or even middle teens and they start dating a, an unbeliever, mm-hmm. and, and they come to me and say, well, I know it's not really good, but I'm afraid that if I really clamp down, they'll rebel. Mm-hmm. And my message is, no, they are rebelling. Yeah. So, so if they were smoking dope... <laughs> You've already lost the battle. Yeah, if they were yeah. smoking dope right now or uh, got drunk three nights a week, is that would you tell me the same thing? Yeah. And I would say, when you allow your kids' hearts to get connected, mm-hmm. that will... When, when you when you have infatuation and feelings of love, mm-hmm. your IQ drops about thirty points, uh-huh. and your holy Q drops about sixty. Uh-huh. And you can make the Bible and anything say anything you want. Uh-huh. And so we one is we wanted we taught them early on. Mm-hmm. We um, we really spent time when they were young and, and talked about the areas of sexuality mm-hmm. appropriately. And so it was sort of a again letting out the string. And we talked about this is what you're going to experience. I mean, a, a young man. When you have a wet dream, this is mm-hmm. what's happening, and here's how God's made you. Right. Our daughter, when you're developing, yeah. and then it was pretty soon. You know, this is because God has something special for you. Right. And we tried to picture the adventure and the joy of what God has, and you know, some were easier than others. Right. And, and then, and then I think that those issues of uh, sexual purity were not about. Um, you can't do this, you can't do that, or you either parent out of fear or out of faith. Right. And I think what you get a parent is out of faith and say, you know what, your sexuality is precious. Mm-hmm. It's gift. It's wonderful. It's good. And and you know, now we have research that talks about the, the bonds that occur actually in the brain. Right. And, and so you want your kids to understand it's something that's holy mm-hmm. and, and therefore here's how to prepare for that. Right. Yeah, and, and I think this is an extremely important discussion because I think that as I listen to you, we we did a podcast earlier with um, when we talked about sexuality, mm-hmm. and um, and we had our our two of people who teach sexuality here and a, and a sex counselor, and sh- and what you're saying about life in general is the way they said handle sexuality, that you talk about it, you create an environment in which you can have a conversation where you can talk about anything, yeah. and, you, and you set a tone of, in, 
of I'll use the word engagement really of engagement on the topic that that uh, where you come alongside your child in, in in a way and and set an environment so that through the entirety of their life you're available for them in the yeah. area. And it sounds like that's what you're what you're what you're talking about. And well, so people, you know, I mean, you know, so we we need to be. If I'm listening to right. me right now, I, I'm I'm creating pictures that are not true about right. what I've said. So right. here's what people need to understand: I, I had one son who just absolutely was rebellious. We went through about three and a half, four years of, you know, I'm not going to live this way. And, yeah. and I mean, it was really, really hard. He didn't go outside of big moral boundaries, uh-huh. but I mean, it was horrendous. We, um, I remember my one son in college who came home and in tears and dating a girl, great Christian girl, and literally saying, Dad, you know, how do you ever stop lusting? I mean, yeah. everything. I mean, so this was real life. This right. wasn't like, but but he said, you know, I've I've thought about this, and you know, we sat on his bed. And I said, son, let, let me tell you about my college years. Uh-huh. Let me tell you where I struggled, because uh-huh. your kids need to understand <laughs> that you've been there. You've That's done right. not something wrong with them. Um, we've been through the time where they meet that person and they're convinced they're the right person, uh-huh. and you and your wife or or you're a single parent, you're sitting up in bed alone going. They marry this person. Man, this is going to be a train wreck. Mm-hmm. And 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 yet, you know, they're 21 years old, 22 yeah. years old. Uh, one of the things I think you always want to do is have those people in your home, that whole environment where you get to know them and where you can keep talking about what's going on. But so this isn't clean. I just yeah, want people yeah, to know yeah. this. It's this very is not messy. Like, oh, it, it is yeah. really tough. But yeah. Here's a picture that's always been helpful. If you if if you're the parent here and and this is your child, mm-hmm. what you need to understand, you need to build a bridge of relationship and the stronger that bridge of trust and relationship, the more truth that can go over that bridge. Hmm. And so there's times where a lot of weight cuz down deep in their heart, even though you 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 get to the bottom of that mm-hmm. ladder in some ways, down deep in their heart, your kids, whether they act like it or not, super respect your opinion Mm -hmm. and they want your approval Mm -hmm. and there's just really hard times where i remember with my daughter at one point i said honey i really love you and she said dad i just want you to bless this Mm -hmm. you know he's a godly guy and etc this and um i said honey i would love to and i've prayed i've fasted i love you Mm -hmm. i'm for you but your life vision is this and his life vision and history is this Mm -hmm. and I'm behind you 100%, but I can't be dishonest with you. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we were in tears. We had a, about a nine month period where we'd always been really close, and mm-hmm. it was, well, Dad, you know, you're welcome to your opinion. Yeah. You know, I'm 21 years old, I'm a junior in college. And, and boy, what a, what a, I mean, what a hard time that was. Mm-hmm. And yet, you know, and it was, it was like this, you mm-hmm. know. So, uh, but at the, the end of the day, I think our kids, um, They'll make wise decisions. They might always be the ones that you like, but it is a journey. And I, I just want people to understand there's not some, oh, if you do this little formula now. By I God's mean, grace, they I mean, married well. Join us next week for part two of The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well. Love well.